Okay, I'm going to give this uh, auxiliary lecture or makeup lecture on the closed loop control of the DC motor. I think, first of all, I'd like to just show the overall block diagram of what we mean by the closed loop control of the DC motor. So what we have is we've got our motor. We have our shaft of the motor. It's going to be connected to some kind of a torque load. We've talked about different types of loads on the DC that you can have on any motor. Uh, and we introduced uh, the following possible types. We have, first of all, a linear load. Um, and in that case, um, the load torque, it would be equal to, say, some B load value times the mechanical speed. We have a what we call an affinity load and in this case the load torque would be equal to say let's say some K value of the load times the square of the speed. And then we could also have a constant load where we just have some T load that's always constant independent of the speed. Okay, so we introduced these in class and some examples would be, this is a, a viscous load. It's, so it's, it's really not super common, but uh, I don't know if I can come up with any good examples at the moment, but this is the most common pumps and fans. And then a constant load torque is very close to what we would probably see in a, let's say, in a crane or a hoist, something like that, just very simplistically. Okay, so you've got different types of loads, and then they are connected to the motor. We're going to assume this is a permanent magnet DC motor here. Working back from the motor, since it's a permanent magnet motor, then we only need to make an electrical connection to the armature windings. And we're going to control the speed um, by controlling the voltage applied from a four quadrant drive. So with this simple picture of a four quadrant drive, where we have two legs, an A leg and a B leg. We have upper and lower power semiconductors, where this is probably, say, for a medium power application, I'll say for power greater than 10 kilowatts, but less than, say, 300 kilowatts, you would use this IGBT for the power less than 10 kilowatts, you would probably use a, a MOSFET. And this is assuming silicon devices. So we've got these so kind of generalized our power semiconductors and this form of these types of power semiconductors. And we have this shorthand picture of that. So we've got a full bridge or two leg converter with some DC link capacitance. And we could say that our drive is still powered off of a generator somewhere. This is going to always be the case anyway. We've got some kind of AC source right here. And then we've got that feeding into a diode bridge.
we might have some inrush current control here just to start the thing up. And then I'll just put an AC. This could be a three-phase grid power source, or you could say this is inside of, say, an electric vehicle of some kind, um, where this is an alternator. Now you could then, uh, if we want to make, this is actually what I've drawn right here. This is actually a two-quadrant um, DC to DC converter. If we wanted to make it four quadrant, one thing we could do is we could just put a battery across the DC link. And then if we had uh, negative regenerative energy, it could go in here and charge the battery. So this is something you might see in a, it's a four quadrant converter now, and it's like what you might see in an electric vehicle. So quick summary or repeated what we've talked about quite a bit. This is your motor drive system. If we want to make this thing a closed loop system from a hardware perspective, what do we need to do? First of all, in any hardware system, we're going to have to um, have some kinds of controls for our devices anyway, if it's say open loop. So, I can say that the control hardware is going to break down into three, maybe four different blocks. So working from the motor side back, we're going to have some kind of a controller here. This is where we would implement um, the commands that we want to provide to the motor. If once we have closed loop controls, we'll We'll implement the closed loop controls in here. It may be a, a microprocessor or a digital signal processor. Um, it's going to interface with some kind of control so that you can turn this thing on and off or change uh, the settings monitor what's going on. So generally we would call this part of it an HMI, human machine interface. It could be a little control panel on the front or something. So you've got that, that HMI. You've got to be able to synthesize what you've got coming out of the controller, the actuating signals. And really, what what is that? Well, it's going to give you the uh, um, on-off signal. If it's a DC uh, drive, we would have one duty cycle command that we're synthesizing from whatever this controller is doing, whatever the HMI told it to do. And if we have closed loop in there, it's going to... Um, uh, also implement the closed loop controls and process the input feedbacks, which I'll talk about in a moment. But then we have to have some kind of a logic that will implement uh, pulse width modulation and sequencing of the switches. Well, I can just say kind of a state machine that would tell it what to do when and what type of switches, whether it's going to soft start the front end here by controlling these thyristors and then once that happens start gating these devices okay so this is logic and then it's going to synthesize your gates signals and then the gate signals need to have some Act electrical isolation and kind of a power boost from going from the control signal level world um, to the power world through the gate. So we have to be able to provide some energy to these things to turn them on and turn them off. 
So we could also say we have a isolation and some amplification. And this is what you would call your gate drives. So you can say you've got these lines that are going to the gates. And what it really does is we have at this level, everything's at some control ground, say digital ground. Um, here, we're going to have a isolated ground that takes us into the power world right here. System power ground here, it could be connected to this line uh, or it could be connected back here, in which case you wouldn't connect it here. But then you've got this kind of virtual ground that you're going to need to create for the devices on the top. Uh, so stepping back, if you say, okay, I've got my, I'm going to do the uh, system level power ground connected to the DC bus, it would look like that. And then you've got these virtual grounds right here. If you reference it to the, the uh, to the generation or source, then it's you're going to move it to there. Okay, so it gives you a basic idea of what you would need to do. And then, of course, if you do that, you would have to have every gate separately isolated to its own ground. These would be real grounds. If you just had this ground in the bottom, this virtual ground might be created through what's called a bootstrap. Uh, hardware or something. And then of course you've got these other signals that you would have to synthesize to charge up the capacitor. So we got those three, those coming here to these devices. And they've got possibly their own isolation. So really what I'm putting this box here is all, uh, it's isolation and amplifier. You've got um, up to one of these things per device where it has all the isolation and everything in it. There are two state variables in a DC motor and those are the two things therefore that we can control. So if we start first with the speed working from the load backward, we would have to put some kind of a position or speed transducer. As we've talked about in class, the speed transducer is not, that just say measures speed like a uh, tachometer. That's not a very common, commonly used device. The most common devices, most commonly used devices today are, and this is kind of in the order of cost and precision, just your garden variety encoder, the absolute value, the absolute encoder, and the resolver. The other sensors we would need, and in this case we just need one of them, is a current sensor. So we're going to take a signal off of these. This would be, say, a Hall effect current sensor that can measure transient and DC both. And that's going to give you your armature current feedback. And this other one is going to give you your your speed of the shaft here. So these two, these this is basically your real world. It's going to be converted into analog um, signal level signals and then eventually to digital signals. And we've gone through in class kind of the details be, of the position and speed feedback, so I won't cover that. But this is basically your whole hardware system. Now why have I gone through all this again? Well, we're going to make some block diagrams again of this that include not only the motor but all of the rest of the system. And we're going to simplify them down into functions. And I think it might help just to recognize where the linear and the nonlinear parts of the system are. So we have the, the motor itself and even the load 
uh, the if you have say the linear load plus the motor you have a linear system here very simple to apply classical control techniques to do the feedback if you don't have any nonlinearities. But then, where do you introduce nonlinearities? You do introduce some here in how the speed is, say, synthesized from a position device sensor, if it's some kind of encoder, if it's a resolver, that's mostly an analog device, so there's uh, very little nonlinearity linearity there. You get the signal back to the analog interface. It's a linear system, but the converting to digital will uh, be some nonlinear system, but it can be represented as a little bit of error and a little bit of uh, delay in time. The current Hall effect sensor is a analog type of a device, fairly linear. There can be some error introduced at the analog interface. There's just the nonlinearity comes into the digital side that gives you some delay. We now have the drive. It's a highly nonlinear system. That whole thing could be uh, treated as some kind of a transport, first order transport delay as well. Um, and the faster you switch these devices, the less it's important it is to do that. The more that the behavior in the motor uh, really approaches an average type system and its connection to the control is a delay that um, is dominated by these things more than anything. Let's now make uh, the block diagram starting say at the shaft the motor is going to produce some torque T electrical the load torque is here subtracts off of that there's combined inertia of the shaft and the load right here now we have a torque constant that corresponds as we know to the lambda a to the magnet current of the armature comes in here that gets formulated by the 1 over SL, the armature inductance. The armature resistance is here. The applied armature voltage is right there. We've got these two parts. Now they couple together through the back EMF constant, which is also lambda AM. This is the back EMF voltage EA. So your drive starts right here. We're going to have a first order function. It has some kind of a constant on the top, an S times some kind of tau. We're going to assume that this incorporates the pulse width modulation and all the scaling and everything associated with that. So this will just be the commanded voltage. We have our signals to our controls so that we can have the closed loop controls. So, so one of them is the current. That would be what we'd say is our inner loop. The other one would be our speed. That would be our outer loop signal. So they look like this. And the outer loop signal is going to be your transducer, your analog interface, your analog to digital, we're going to represent this as a gain. Everything in our feedback will give an H. So this is H omega S for speed. And we could call this H C S for current. So there's your current transducer. And at this point right here, we're in our control world. Okay. So this is our power electronics plus the PWM happening right here. Gate drives, all that. And then this is where we are going to execute, implement our feedback controls. We've got coming in now from this point, we have, we have our armature current in the control domain. There might be some delay and errors in there. And then we have our omega M as well. But if we start at the beginning on the left, and start to work into the middle where we're going to close the loops. Let's add our controllers. So the first thing going from right to left back to the beginning is the inner loop controller. That would be your current controller. That's going to produce 
a voltage command. So whichever controller is closest to the drive, the output of that controller is the armature voltage command that you want to track to. We call this an inner loop because it's going to control the most inside state variable. So we have a summing point right here. We have some kind of a current command that's been synthesized. And what we really want to accomplish with our controls is a command following. So this is the feedback. What comes out of the outer loop controller is the current command. That would be the speed controller. So you've got your current controls and you've got your speed control or regulator. What comes into this is error signal between the commanded speed and the feedback speed, omega. So this is now a synthesized command for the speed. And we're going to directly try to drive, force the speed to track with the command. You never make anything change suddenly. You're going to ramp up your speed at some desired rate, T ramp omega to get to omega m star from zero. You're putting that directly in there and you're going to try to force it to, uh, to track with that. We're going to try to simplify this. Um, and I've repeated a little bit of what we've had in class, but at this point I'm going to try to segue to what is completely new. So we have the speed controller, G sub S. It has this form. It has a K for the speed, a, a proportional gain. It's got a function that looks like this, an S tau. S, it's on the bottom, not on the top. This is associated with a pole, and this is associated with a zero. And when you're applying uh, classical control techniques, you're really applying a kind of a pole zero cancellation approach. So your controller brings in the zeros to get rid of the poles that you don't like. That's the simplistic way of looking at it. And so that's your speed controller. It's got this, it's got two parameters, tau sub s and k sub s. And then you've got your current controller, which is going to have a k sub c, an s, a tau sub c plus one, and an s tau s. Now what these represent are proportional plus integral controls, or we'll call it a pi controls or regulator. We have the power electronics, GDS. There's a gain here, which is K sub D, that's pretty much one. And then we have an S tau D plus one. And then finally, we've got the feedback gain blocks, H sub C of S for the current. It's got some current gain error and some delay. And then we have the speed transducer that's going to have some error and delay as well. And again, what we're just trying to do is account for these things. But I'm going to show you that to come up with a controller, your best bet is to first just ignore them, which is exactly what we will do. So we're going to simplify this whole thing. First going to assume that the delay in the drive is much less than the time constant of the armature. So we've defined that T sub A or tau sub A as LA over RA, the L over R time constant for the armature. And we're going to assume that KD equals 1. So here we've taken care of our power electronics, our pulse width modulation, and our drive. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to assume 
that the delays introduced by the feedbacks tell i and tell omega are both less than tau d and there are no errors in the feedback so the ki is 1 and the k omega is 1 so now we've taken care of that thing as well and we have the main fund the main functionalities of the feedback and we've taken out all of these secondary effects The result is that GD of S is going to equal KD, which is 1. The HI of S is going to be equal to KI. That's going to be 1. Or sorry, it's the HC of S. The HC of S is going to be equal to KI. That's 1. And the H omega of S is going to be equal to k omega, which is 1. So we've simplified a lot, and now we have our, our new block diagram. We have a speed trajectory command that we want to track to. We have our speed feedback going into the speed controller. The, we want to have command following or tracking, and so what this controller is supposed to do is it's supposed to drive the error, omega s error, to zero in the steady state. And it's supposed to uh, eliminate any oscillations or instabilities. I'd like to now just take a moment to talk about the controller block in general. So I already had introduced that we have this form for any control and I'll just do this for the speed control. It's, it's a gain block g sub s is a function of s. s remember is j omega uh, because what we're going to do is we're going to utilize these blocks, first of all, to perform open loop and closed loop analysis using our MATLAB tools um, to try to guide us in the selection of the gain or gains or gain and time constants for these controllers, depending on the form of the controller. Now we can have this form that we've already introduced, but it can be adapted to another form that looks like this. We have a proportional gain for the speed control in this case, plus a integral gain for the speed control. And in this form here, we start to get into something that is more meaningful for our Simulink uh, implementation. It also really helps us understand what the controller is actually doing. It's not just a mathematical um, transfer function that we're adding to the system to uh, change its behavior but it becomes even more meaningful as a function that will shape the behavior of the system. So the first thing is we've got our proportional gain right here. And the uh, translating this over to our block diagram representation, we have an, 
a speed error. And we're going to take that and multiply it times a proportional gain. We're also going to take that error, multiply it times a integral gain. And perform an integral of that. So I'll represent it the way it might be, it would be shown in uh, or at least one way it could be shown in Simulink assuming we are doing continuous integrations that would be equivalent to the integral with time of whatever is coming into that. We're summing these two together and ultimately down the line these drive some sort of actuation in the system in this case we're actuating the motor by by changing the voltage that we're applying to it and that will affect the signal that we're feeding back which is the speed so in response to the actuation the speed will change with the goal of driving this error towards zero So the first thing is, let's just say that we have um, this actual speed itself. And we can just, for argument's sake, assume that the speed is operating at some steady state operational point, And there's a torque disturbance. A, in this case I'll say suddenly we increase the torque that's going to cause the speed to dip to go down and I'll show down here the the torque load so we had a static load and suddenly the torque went up and if we don't do anything the speed will stay at this point and what our goal is that we is to uh, maintain the speed at some commanded value so this would be that value omega m star we know that the torque dynamics can be described by this block diagram here we have the torque constant we have a current going into that creating the torque applied from the motor the load torque disturbance comes in here and that if we were to take the difference between these two, we could even include the losses. They, they will change uh, as the speed downstream changes. So if we first just say let's uh, divide what's coming out of the summing junction by 1 over j, that's the acceleration, that's the rate of change of the speed with time and the integral of that is the speed that this value here will drop with speed and this is causing the change in equilibrium of the system upstream of this you have a VA that can change from your uh, whatever your power electronics is doing in response to the feedback controls so if we have a feedback controller which is trying to force the error between the commanded and actual speed to zero the proportional um, gain times that error and in this case we are going to have greater than zero that's going to force a dynamic increase 
in armature current because um, the controls will force the armature voltage to change in that same direction. So if we really look at what is the, the armature voltage itself, VA is sitting at its uh, steady state point and instantly there's going to be a response proportional to the speed change times gain it's going to go up. Now the proportional gain can start to make a change in the speed itself downstream, but it's if we don't have something else, it's not going to force that speed up to uh, the command again. And so the second part of our controller, the integral part, is going to take the error over time and integrate it. And what comes out here gets added to the actuation that changes the current. So this here is going to give you kind of instantaneous results here and this is going to give you a integrating change in it and once the speed hits the command then we have a uh, you know a zero error. Now it's not always going to go right up here and stop. It may overshoot a little. So sometimes you could have a response like this where the speed has the disturbance. You've got say some oscillation. This is for a really high gain integrator. It's going to overshoot and then things are going to go in the other direction. It's going to want to force the thing down and it may settle out over time to the command that you want to track to. On the other hand, you could have a really slow integrator and a low gain system where you get the uh, step load change. Your KP doesn't do very much at all. It's mostly uh, dominated by the integrator. It may take a quite a long time before it gets to the steady state speed. So you have a trade-off between these overshoots overcompensating here, but getting yourself to the to the point you want to be faster versus having imperceivable overshoots but taking longer to get there. But at the end of the day, the only thing that can force you to track and to get back here is this integration state. Well, now that we've got an idea of how this controller works, I'm going to go back and talk about the block diagram for a little bit, and then we'll return to this dynamic behavior. So if I write out the full controller that we have after all these simplifications we've made, we have the uh, speed command that we're trying to track to. There's the speed feedback here. That's the speed error. It's going through our speed controller. The output of that speed controller is the current command that we would need to track to in order to force the speed to change. We will do that by changing the torque. The torque is proportional to the current. So by changing the current, we change the torque. So this is really what we're calling a, a cascaded PI control with an inner and an outer loop. The inner loop produces the armature voltage command that your drive needs to track to. So we're just going to represent the drive as this constant, which is unity. And then the outcome of that is the armature voltage that is being applied to the motor. That's your point of actuation. And then we have the motor model itself. So the electrical part of the armature can be re represented by this simple block diagram here. That's the armature current. The armature current feedback is going to the controls. The armature current will become a torque output of the motor that's working to compensate for any change in the torque load. Then we have the shaft dynamics and we have the speed coming out of there. We also have this coupling between the mechanical and electrical through the back EMF, multiplying the speed times the back EMF constant, k sub b here. And lastly, 
we've got the speed feedback coming here to the controls. Now, what we're really trying to do with each of these controllers is we're trying to, to shape the dynamics or change the dynamics. So if you say, okay, I have a, uh, a transfer function that a controller is operating on. So we can say, let's say that we have only a speed controller and I'm going to get rid of the uh, current controller. I'm just going to, that would be a single loop approach. I have a speed here, command, I have the GS of S. Now the output of that would be the command and voltage to the motor. That is going to go through the drive. We're going to produce an armature voltage here. But recall that we came up with a closed loop expression for everything happening right here, excluding the torque disturbance. If I just want to look at this from a stability standpoint in the frequency domain, I'm going to ignore this we're going to be doing a small signal dynamic analysis and that's really how classical control techniques are done. But recall that putting all this together gives you a second order expression and we were able to come up with what that expression might look like. That being what I'm writing here inside of this block back EMF constant divided by the armature resistance times the damping divided by a 1 plus S tau 1 times 1 plus S tau 2. And recall that we derived these from solving the roots of a quadratic equation where we started with this denominator having a form of s squared we'll say s a times s squared just to be general plus b times s plus c so the quadratic equation is negative b plus and minus the root of b squared minus 4 times the product of a times c over 2a. So that's just solving the roots of the quadratic of the denominator and that gave us these tau terms. So you could say let's take this whole um, second order model giving us the speed. Let's take the speed feedback here and put it into our controller. Well, what, what you've got here is you do have a single transfer function that is the speed in response to the voltage. And that's, that's the plant dynamics. The control dynamics over here are supposed to give you a transfer from a speed command to an armature voltage. So basically you're trying to put these two together to force the speed and omega m star to be one. So what you really have is you have an overall transfer function of the response of the speed to the commanded speed. You're trying to force them over time. If anything in any disturbance changes the equilibrium of the system, this controller here is supposed to force everything to go back to equilibrium or back to a unity ratio between what the actual speed and the commanded speed are. That's command tracking. Now it's easy to see how you can do this with a system in this form. The problem with just having a speed loop, a single speed loop, is that you don't have a lot of degrees of freedom to make this thing do what you want it to do. So you're not going to be able to compensate for all of the dynamics that are giving you trouble. You just don't have very many knobs to turn here and you're always going to get a second order response 
from any change in VA to omega M. So it's going to be virtually impossible to eliminate undershoots, overshoots, and ringing. So ringing would be like resonant behavior that eventually dampens out. This is the thing here that's going to do your dampening for you. At best, it will dampen out, but at worst, you might get a continuous ring. So to kind of describe what I mean by that is that in a second order system, you've got a disturbance to the speed that's driving it off of your command. And in order to get it back on track, it's going to start to do this. And you're going to hope that eventually it will dampen out. If it doesn't, then you really have an unstable system. And in fact, if you do too bad of a job of tuning that thing, these little oscillations can increase in their magnitude over time. That's a truly unstable system, something that's looking like this. So you really don't want that to happen. So it would be a lot easier if you could, you, you, what you really have is you have two four first order systems. You've got your mechanical system and you've got your electrical system here. Problem is that you got this thing here in the middle and you need to form this thing so that the current controller is controlling what's happening here and the speed controller is controlling what's happening here. That's what you want to do. The pro but you can see how difficult it will be to formulate this correctly because this back EMF feedback internal to the system here or coupling crosses the current feedback line. So we can rearrange the system and make it look better uh, so that we can analytically design the control gains for this and for this. So how would we do that? If we just look at the motor itself, we have the armature voltage and we've got the electrical part of the armature and we have the current here going to the electromechanical and the shaft part of things. Now you've got the back EMF that's feeding back around to here. That's causing our problem. Can we somehow move this over to here? Well, we can. It's mathematically the same thing if we were to simply say, I know that the current goes through this block here and that's going to give me a speed then I can take the current here. Oh, and there's a KB on top here. I left that out. That I can take the same thing and I can say, well, I want to get a speed. So I'm going to multiply the current here times KB over SJ plus B. That gives me the speed. And I just multiply it again times the back EMF constant. And now I have the back EMF. So now I have here two first order systems that are cascaded and I can put a inner loop controller on the inside state variable current and I have an outer loop controller on the speed. So it's that simple. We just need to come up with this expression here. Now what we need to do there is that we have a V, we have an armature voltage in giving us a current, armature current responding to that. So we want to come up with a, a, block, a gain for that. And that will end up being this gain here, Sj plus B over Kb squared plus Sla plus Ra times Sj plus B. This is all fine, but it's really, we want to, if we're doing everything in MATLAB, we could leave it at this. We could just say, let's take this expression right here, and that is what goes right here. We could just plug that in, but you don't get a lot of insight from that. And so we have to go through the same process that, they went, that we went through here. We would 
go going to this when we look at the denominator we would multiply out and get a quadratic form of a s squared plus b s plus c that's what we we did right here and then solve for the roots and then you can come up with an expression that looks very much like this one okay so krishnan krishnan actually does this if you want to go through uh, and really understand it, have at it. I actually wasted a lot of time doing that myself. But what the expression that Krishna comes up with for the ratio of for the ratio of I A response to a V A input is a constant K one multiplied times a numerator with a zero introducing a zero, which is s tau m plus 1 over s tau 1 prime is what I'll call it plus 1 times s tau 2 prime plus 1. So you have this second order expression that you've come up with. Um, recall that the tau m is j over b. That's the uh, mechanical time constant for the system. So your complete block diagram with the controls is going to look like this. So we have here an inner loop for the current and an outer loop going around this whole thing for the speed. So you can design the first uh, loop and the gains for the current controller to get the tracking that you want between this current command and its feedback. And then you can take what this is and then design the speed around the whole thing that's in the middle here. The total thing is, is these, these are a second order system, but you're controlling this to make this stiffer. And so let's say if you had a, um, if you could have something, a kind of controller here, instead of a this continuous controller, you could do a very nonlinear control, like a hysteresis current mode control, which would essentially make this just look like a gain. We get rid of all the dynamics. Would, uh, just If this goes a little bit high, that's going to force it to go the other way. It's Another word for it is a bang bang. It just acts on the air. This works pretty well in power electronic systems. If you have enough inductance, say in the armature, it would work very well. And then this is just a gain block, and the whole rest of the system just looks like a first order system. It's going to be very easy to do command tracking because there are no second order effects in the system at all. In a cascaded approach, what's helpful here is let's say that I really care about what the current is, I need to constantly keep it under control. The hysteresis does that for you. But you can do this with a PI controller as well. Now here's the reason why you would want to do that. Recall from the homework three that we did where we had a DC motor and we set up a simulation where we would apply a open loop command I'm showing that right here, commanded armature voltage with the intent of achieving a certain armature speed in the steady state, and trying to ramp it up as fast as possible. So this is a simulation of the present homework, uh, but without closed loop control. So it's a similar situation, the only difference being that we are accelerating a load that's constant. So that's what you can see right here is the load torque being constant. Well, recall from the prior homework that during the ramp up time, you're going to try to achieve an armature current that's going to get you to a torque that corresponds to the slope of this commanded slope of the speed. If this happens very quickly for this simulation is within one resonant uh, period of the second order system that we're trying to excite with this command. 
But one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted the to limit the point to which the armature current goes during ramp up. We can see here this open loop situation. We don't have anything to limit the current so that we could hold it. Let's say that we had a, a max current that we didn't want to exceed of 500 amps. Well, there's nothing to keep that current from going beyond that point during this ramp up time. If we had a closed loop on the speed with no inner current loop, we could probably get a much better speed response than what is shown here. But we wouldn't have anything to do to, to be able to con constrain the armature current while the uh, speed is, is increasing. So we would likely exceed the limited current. This is a reason why we want to have a, a closed loop on the inner current. Now with that same simulation, I manually changed the ramp rate to a point that I wouldn't exceed a limit. I was saying, well, let's not try to get beyond 500 amps in this case. And you can see here, I was successful at doing this in the open loop, but the price paid was that I had to really slow down the rate of rise of the speed. So it went from something that could have been achieved in under, say, 0.05 seconds, as we're showing here, to something that takes about almost a half a second to ramp up. Now, I think it could be granted that this is really too fast of a ramp rate anyway. And uh, we calculated this ramp rate ignoring all of the dynamics involved. and it comes out to be given the limited current that we that they are wanting to keep the armature under, which of course we're not successful at doing, um, still gives you a pretty fast ramp rate, probably much faster than you would need. Um, but what, what the closed loop control could do is it actually would give you the right ramp rate without you having to guess at it, which is what I've done here. So that's kind of a very simplistic way of making this all work together. But if you wanted to, to maximize this rate by holding the current, let's say right at 500 amps, if you wanted to have more like this kind of a behavior here, holding it at a constant during the ramp and then go down to the steady state. That's what the closed loop uh, current regulator is going to give you. So we're going to uh, need to implement these controllers. We've got, as I'm showing here, a di block diagram of what the controllers would really look like with all of the functions involved. And I'm showing this because I want to point out another important uh, feature of this. So first of all, we have our inner current loop control, and it's going to be ensuring that we can track a commanded current against a feedback current, and then we have the outer speed control. But I've added these two limit blocks here, and this introduces a very practical consideration that has to be taken into, an, into account. First of all, what we wanted to do if we focus in on the current loop itself is with this inner current loop, we want to ensure that the armature current itself does not exceed a current limit, a predefined current limit. And so that current limit is shown in this block diagram. We have a limiter here that would be, let's say, limited to a high point, which is the top of this, to IA limit. And if it was a four quadrant converter, then the lower rail would be negative IA limit, say if we wanted to accelerate the speed in the opposite direction. And so this will clamp the output of the speed controller so that it doesn't exceed, and that will help us 
uh, track to that limit. He, there's another limiter in my model here. Now this is actually something you would probably put in there, but it's it's also uh, inherent to what's going to happen because you can only put out so much voltage and apply it to the motor because you're limited by the DC link. So in this case, um, we have another limiter and we could say let's let that go as high as a VA max point that we've defined and then again if this is a four quadrant and we can go in the opposite direction we could say minus VA max is the lower rail. So this is one important Point. But there's another even more subtle thing going on. Let's focus on the speed control, what's inside of here. So we're implementing a proportional plus integral controller. We have a proportional gain, Kp, um, S, that times the speed error here. We also have an integral gain, Kis, and this is going into an integrator. And now imagine this is going into a limiter right here. So what drives you to hit one of these rails is the error is such that the demanded current is higher than the limit here. And then when you hit that point, it's not going to let any more current go through. So as a result, if your controller gains are all tuned correctly, this current here is not going to change anymore once you hit this um, top limit right here. Yet, uh, um, the rest of the system's just going to keep trying to respond. And generally, why you're getting hitting this limit is because of this omega error. So as long as you're in the limit, the omega error is not changing anything downstream but you're stuck at whatever that omega error happens to be. It, it may even increase. Or, um, and then there may be a point at which the dynamics start to reduce this, but you're completely dependent on what's happening downstream. Meanwhile, you have an integrator. You're going to continue to integrate this error, and it's going to give you a an output if you want to look at what this output right here actually is. What you're, you're hoping will happen is that you get an error that drives these the proportional bus integral error to uh, give you a higher outcome here, a positive outcome, and you would like, it, so this should represent what the armature current is, you want the armature current to look like that, but because of this, it's going to ask, it's going to try to command your armature current to go higher. While this is limiting what your current regulator downstream is doing, and once, say, your ramp is complete, it'll come back down. It should come back down. The problem you're going to have is that you're going to have so much error behind this integrator that it's going to take a long time, if at all, for this to come down to where you want it to be. And it's all because of this area here. This is what's called integrator windup. So how do you take care of that? 
Well, what you need to do is you need to ensure that this integrator stops integrating when you hit the clamp. It's that simple, but it's not the simplest thing to implement in a simulation. So I'm going to show you my simulation. And I've done the work for you and I've shared this block with you. So I have this simulation set up and I can run either an open loop with this manual switch or I can do closed loop. So it's pretty convenient. But let's go inside of this block here. This is my cascaded PI regulator. I've created uh, a custom proportional plus integral block shown here. And it, I can actually set the gains and I can set the limits on this thing. Well, if we want to go under that and let's look at what I've done here. So I've made this into a masked thing so I can add parameters on the top, but I have to go look under the mask and see what's in there. And so you can see what I've done here. This is a, uh, a discrete time integrator with a limit on it. And this is a block that you can get from the library. Um, and I've set up my gains here. I'm setting this thing up as a discrete time with a 100 microsecond sample on the controller. Um, but this is what I have here. I, if I, I have a limit inside, that, that limit is set by what I told it to be in my upper mask. And if it goes beyond that limit, I'm going to send a signal a digital signal here that if it goes out above the limit right here this digital signal is going to or with an enable and this enable keeps it when the enable is at a, a zero this thing will integrate but if it goes to a one um, this will stop integrating and so this just stops it from integrating. If I go below the lower limit, it will stop it from integrating. And in addition to that, uh, when I set this thing up so that when these, this output here goes back to zero and it starts integrating, it will end up being initialized at the latest output. Um, of the integrator. So effectively this holds the integrator where it was supposed to be and then it just keeps picking it, it keeps on integrating from where it was once the error is such that you're no longer above the limit. And so this was this isn't the easiest thing to implement. It's not a standard block. I, I haven't ever found one in, in Simulink. So this is a useful thing. That's why I put this up onto Canvas for you to use. Now let's come back to this, uh, these controllers. And I want to give you a little bit of insight on how to figure out the gains. So focusing, first of all, on the inner loop, this is what our plant looks like. And really what we, we want to do is we want to look at the open loop gain of this loop here and then let's figure out based on what we're seeing there and what's in the textbook uh, the best way to select what we're going to have in our uh, current controller here but even before we do that we should verify that the motor looking like this is exactly the same as this. So the only difference between these two block diagrams is that this one here on the bottom has no place that you can pull the current out of. You could use this to design an outer loop control only, but we had to reformulate it into this uh, format here so that we could design the inner and the outer loops. So first thing, let's verify that we have this right. Now what I we can do, it's, it's complicated to 
derive these expressions. So I'm going to go to what the book gave us. So we converted what's inside of this box here. We, we went back to the model where we had the individual armature uh, cascaded with the mechanical shaft and then we rearranged things so that um, effectively the back EMF term wouldn't cross the two by changing the loop and we came up with these extra three constants derived them and so what they are are k1 being equal to the damping b total damping divided by kv squared plus the armature resistance times the total b the tau 1 prime and tau 2 prime would have, got, would have been derived from a quadratic solution. And in this case, um, the tau 1 prime would be 1 over, these are solutions to the root, so the quadratic. Um, this is the inverse, this, this tau 1 is the inverse of one of the roots. So I'm going to write that. So I did that. I wrote out the expressions. Uh, this is tau 1, and then I found tau 2. The difference between tau 1 and tau 2 is that there's a minus sign here. The one thing of note is that these terms are in a square root. And so if this first term is less than the second term, you're going to have an imaginary um, um, a j here. And same thing goes here, meaning that you would have two an, an underdamped system. Well, we know it is an underdamped system, and it turns out that we do have that. That introduces some um, interesting challenges when it comes to applying the technique that was proposed by the uh, by Krishnan for coming up with a, a regulator. It's not completely clear to me what he does, so I'm going to show you what I ended up doing in that case. But first things first, what I did was, I know we know coming into this block is VA and coming out of this block is omega m. And so I came up with the Bode plot of the ratio of omega m to Va, which is really the whole transfer function for the motor. And that's shown right here. So this is uh, the ratio of omega m to an input of Va. Um, this red line is the phase, and the blue is the magnitude of that. And so you can see it's underdamped. It's a second-order system. It's going to have um, no phase delay until it gets to the uh, resonant frequency point right around here. And that's actually the omega naught that when you put this thing in quadratic form. So this is omega naught and what I'm talking about with a denominator look, looking like this. So this is the form of any second order system. And this is what the particular motor in the homework problem, closed loop uh, gain and phase will look like. Also could look at the open loop gain which so actually what you would do is going back to this form here, the open loop gain would be this forward gain here times the reverse gain, kb squared. And that is this plot right here. Some people would call this the, uh, the loop gain. 
And what we get out of this is we can find the crossover frequency right here. And you can look at what the phase is when this crosses zero, and that's going to tell you whether the system's stable, or in other words, uh, whether it's highly underdamped, which it is. And uh, so this, this definitely shows that's the case. What we're trying to do is we're trying to say, okay, uh, what does, if I were to put these two, cascade those together, is that going to be the same as this? And in fact, it is. So I did the a Bode plot of it. And I have the two gains and the two phases plotted on top of each other. And they're identical here. So I know my model is good and whatever I'm going to get from that. So the next step is to go back to this and find this loop gain um, with the selected gains inside of, of this controller here. First of all, we'd have to come up with some kind of a design for the controller. Now what uh, Krishnan does, recall that this current controller had this form of a constant Kc times 1 plus s tau c over s tau c. So you have a zero here and Krishna, Krishna says let's set t tau c equal to what I'm calling tau 2 prime. Set those equal to each other. And if I just do that in my Bode plot, and then I have, all I need to do is find a value for Kc. So I usually will just start with setting that to something like a 1. If I look at these two plots here, this is the loop gain would be simply the product of these two. This plot here is just that gain. So that would be the gain of VA over IA. And it's an open loop gain or loop gain. Uh, it starts at a zero um, angle and it goes up to a positive uh, 90. And then when it hits this um, point here, it goes to a negative 90 and starts to roll off again. It's kind of weird. And what what does this look like here, the, K, the G C by itself? Well, it's a, we're, we expect it to have the, a form like this. The integrator is dominating at the low frequencies, and then when you hit the point of 1 over tau C, it should flatten out. And then we would expect to see the phase angle uh, being 180 degrees and then going up to a 90 degrees. And so that's exactly what we're seeing right here. And when we have these cascaded in log dv form, it's just adding these two together, adding these the, these curves, the blue curves together here. Then you're, you're looking at the angle, the phases, uh, the ones on the on the numerator, we'll subtract whatever's on the denominator. But you're just putting these two things together, and what what happens is you're going to get you're going to get a plot that looks like this. So it actually looks very nice. What we've done is we have gone we have something that starts at uh, 180 when the magnitude is above zero, but by the time it crosses over to zero at this point right here, the magnitude is at 90. So this says that I would have a very stable system. But in in reality, what, what this tell, what does this uh, controller gain actually look like? I've got some Kc equal one, and I'm going to have a tau, um, I have a tau 2 prime that's equal to some 
a value that's a real value, I'll just call it an alpha, plus some imaginary value that's called, I'll call it a beta. So that's kind of a weird form. How do you convert this into something that looks like where we're taking um, some Kc1 plus S tau C. This is the controller we have to in implement and, and we can rewrite it like this. That's how it's set up in my simulation as some proportional gain Kp plus some integral gain Ki C over S. Now this is actually looking like a 1 times 1 plus S alpha plus J beta. The tau C is on the bottom as well. And that would be S alpha plus J beta. You have to convert between these two forms using something that has an imaginary component in here. I can't really get my head around that, um, but I'll. What I decided to do was just say that tau c equals the magnitude of alpha plus j beta, and when I did that, this is this is what I get for my open loop gain. So it actually doesn't look very great if you but it, but maybe it's okay. So if you you're looking at this um, this is the magnitude and the crossover point is here, but there is sufficient margin. So it tells me well it should work okay. So let's take a look at what we have done just in summary. We've closed a current loop and we've come up with this resultant open loop gain. So it basically looks like the revised gain here representing the ratio of armature current to a voltage input. That's this part of the expression here. And then the open loop gain would be taking that and multiplying it times the current regulator gain here and this uh, term right here that is represents the drive and we're neglecting any delay introduced by the drive and so this is what the Bode plot of that open loop gain looks like where we have set the tau c equal to the absolute value of the tau 2 and the current uh, gain k sub c equal to 1 and this this is what we get. So what's important is looking at the crossover frequency point right here. What frequency does that occur at? So that says that it's around a little bit over 200 and then the phase at that crossover point is at about minus 110 degrees. So we have plenty of phase margin on this inner loop. So this should be working. We should get stable control. And what uh, this whole thing is telling us is that we have controllability under this curve here. So beyond this point, you really can't control the current anymore. That's really what this open loop gain represents. So we say, okay, what is that frequency response? So that's about 250. And if we invert that, it says that we've got about 4 milliseconds of response. We can move the current around. So that really means that you could say, let's say that I've got a current command and I want this thing to move. I can do that movement at 4 milliseconds, but I can't allow it to move any faster than that. So it's limiting how fast I can move the current.
Now, the approach in the textbook, the Krishna textbook, is a fairly conventional approach to designing controls using what we would call a pole zero cancellation. And I've spent time on this recorded lecture to try to illustrate the limitations of this approach and to educate you a little bit on how you would design controllers. What, what the attempt is when you are canceling poles with zeros from your controller, which is effectively what you're doing because your PI regulator in this form looks like you're adding a, a zero here for the current regulator and then another one for the speed regulator, is to cancel things out. So you're saying, okay, I'm going to, first of all, let's make an assumption that S tau sub M is significantly greater than one at the frequencies of interest. So that just becomes that. If you do that, then the S on the top and the bottom cancel here. And if you say, let's let tau c equal tau 2 prime, then these two terms should cancel. And so what you're going to end up with, and you're going to have this additional controller on the outside for the speed, and it's controlling a system that has a total gain. I'm going to fix this, apologize. So you end up with this total gain of kc, kd, K1 tau M divided by tau C times it's just a simple uh, first order expression 1 over 1 plus S tau 1 prime. That's kind of the goal for this kind of a controller. And then this thing here looks like a, a first order response system. And then you have you're going to add uh, another S to this, making it a second order response, but then you can kind of tailor it with this S tau S. And I want to point out that these are open loop responses, not closed loop responses. So the closed loop response would essentially be this expression here. That gets converted into a form where there's a denominator having this kind of an expression. And then the gains, the case of S and the tau S, are tuned to get a critically damped response. That's the conventional, classical uh, control approach. Now, of course, this is only going to work at one operating condition. Uh, then you might have a different response if the load changes. We've started out by assuming we were at no load, kind of assuming that adding load to this would dampen it a little bit more, and so the response would only become more stable. Now, the way that we want to formulate our controller uh, for an implementation in Simulink, as I had explained before, was that we wanted to convert it into these forms here, where in general a proportional gain is going to be equal to whatever the gain was on the outside of the controller. So if my controller in the original form was a K1 plus S tau over S tau, we want it to look like this, these two forms here, where the k is equal to kp, and where the ratio of kp to ki is equal to the tau. So this gives you a understanding of the instantaneous gain properties to an immediate response. And then this tells you the time to drive the error to zero. 
or you can also think about it as the command tracking response. So if the tau or the ratio of Kp to Ki is too large, your actual variable that you're trying to control, say the speed omega sub m or the current i sub a, is going to lag the command. And if you just care about stability, you might say, well, that's fine, but there's a price to be paid by not having a decent response or a fast enough tau. And I think that's going to be the whole point as to why you want to not use the classical control technique. Now to illustrate this, I'm going to just start with the pole zero for the current regulator. So we're starting with design of GCS using pole zero cancellation almost. Rep recognizing that the recognizing that the tau uh, t2 prime that we want to cancel out with tau c would have this kind of real plus imaginary form and so we'll just say let's set tau c equal to the absolute value of this alpha plus beta or um, absolute value of t2 prime and then I just picked a kp equal to 1 and then you can you could tune this if needs be by raising or lower it, lowering it but we've looked at the open loop response and it looks good enough now the next thing we would need to do is to say okay uh, how to tune the speed controller. Well, let's, uh, let's look at the crossover response of IA to IA star in our open loop gain first. And we found that that crossover response was at 250 1 over seconds, or we could say uh, 1 over omega c being equal to 4 milliseconds. And so we would want the resultant tau for the speed loop, which would be the ratio of kps to kis to be much less than 1 over omega c, say for the current loop crossover. So I'm going to pick 1 over tau s or kis over kps equal to 10. That's more than 10 times smaller, and let's see how that works. And that's assuming that I set kps equal to 1. And let's see what kind of a response I would get if I do that. So here's the open loop response of the total system with the cascaded uh, PI regulators. So we've got our proportional gain of the current regulator set to KPC. Now the KIC ends up being equal to 104. That's the absolute value of 1 over tau 2 prime. I set the proportional gain of the speed controller to 1, and then I set the integral to 10. And this is the response that I get. So let's look at the stability criteria first. This is the crossover point, and this is about, it's a little bit, it's, it's roughly around um, 160 degrees, minus 160. So I'm not meeting the phase margin that I want of 30 degree. I should be up a little bit here. 
and I could tune this to to do that but I'm just going to show you the response here if you look at that 3 dB range here you're going to be getting more stable as you move in this direction but as you're coming into this you're a little bit less stable you're getting dangerously close to the 180 degrees so the uh, let's take a look at what the actual simulation gives us so I plug these things in and I run the simulation so let's take a look at what the actual simulation gives us I've implemented this controls I'm running it's compiling right now and now it looks like it's about ready to start simulating and what I'm seeing is this is my command at speed right here what I'm seeing is that this is the voltage command that's driving the system so that it will try to track to the speed command but you can see it's not doing a very good job there's a huge lag between what I am thinking I can get as a command and response what I'm actually getting but you can see there's a good thing going on here is that actually if you look down here at the current the current is being clamped at the limit exactly as I had intended it that to happen um, but the response is fairly slow this is when I make the command and we can say well how much time is that it takes for the current to, to get up to that limit about 26 milliseconds um, I could invite you to go back and look at your uh, tau sub a and see that should give you an idea of how fast you actually could command it and you should be able to actually improve upon that with your controller as I said that what the controls do is they're supposed to shape your response okay so we're looking at this as it's simulating and we see that we have an underdamped response so we're overshooting our speed command it looks like it's starting to dampen out and we can get a little bit of a clue as to what we would do to improve the tuning of this if we look at the phase difference between the speed and the current and we also see the fact that the voltage command here it's it's changing in the direction or overcompensating the speed by going low and it's in some way kind of aggravating the oscillatory behavior that we want to avoid if we look at the current response it is having some oscillatory behavior and it's going in the opposite direction or almost it's not it's not compensating quickly enough so you can think okay the, the speed went down well I want the current to go up to push that speed up but it's lagging by this much time and if you had like a 180 degree a full 180 degree difference between these two then it would be completely unstable but it's eventually dampening out the speed and eventually getting us to where we want to be but it's not a very good response so I've saved my simulation result let's go back and look at this open loop gain try to gain some insight so what this is telling me is that I have controllability of the speed up until I get to this crossover point I'm marginally stable at that crossover point but what is that crossover point from a time uh, response perspective so that's about 10 over seconds so I'm actually have a response of about 0.1 seconds that would 
tell me that I can't change the speed any faster than 100 milliseconds. Um, let's look at our 1 over, let's look at what our tau sub a and our tau sub m are. We should be able to improve upon these significantly. And, um, we want to try to get an idea of as to what we could do to our gains to make things better. So if I go into my MATLAB code that I've written here, I'm just going to find out what tau A is. That's 0.06 milliseconds. And my tau M is 1.16 seconds. So I have, I have improved or I have a different response with the closed loop controls, I would expect that, you know. So probably I should get maybe more than 10 times improvement. Well, with the pole zero cancellation, if you recall my time response of just the current uh, on the armature, the current control was about four milliseconds. So I'm a little bit better than 10 times better. And on the, uh, mechanical response, I'm also about 10 times better. But I've also pre-calculated, looking at the original open loop response, I should have been able to make the speed move faster. I, of course, am overshooting the current. I wanted to be clamped right around here. But I would think I could get closer to this just by looking at this thing here. It's able to move quite quickly. So this tells me I have the capability. The question is, do I have that capability and can I keep this under control? Another thing I want to look at is let's take a look at the current response. You see this uh, phase is, as I go out, it's actually approaching nine, nine, negative 90 degrees. So I effectively have made a first order system by um, the design of my current controller. And perhaps if I push the gains up, I could move this curve out and I could get a lot better response. So what, what if I just say, let's in, improve the response by a significant amount of the current regulator and let's see what happens when I do that. So I'm gonna actually go by, I had 104, remember, for my um, KIC. I'm going to change this now to a thousand, ten times. Now I, uh, I would also need to tune the speed controller, but let's let's leave this alone and see what happens. Often, what you do is you um, make a change on your current regulator first, get your response as fast as you can. And then you, you had a starting point that was reasonably stable. And then you can see where I'm going to go. I'm going to keep the ratio of Ki over Ks the same, but push the gains up to improve the response. So let me, first of all, plot the current gain open loop response. So here's my current lane gain open loop response. And what I've done is I pushed the cross out, crossover point out quite a bit. And I've got my 30 degrees of margin at that point. I'm just right there. So I should be okay. And then if I look at the total open loop response, my crossover gain is is actually still quite low because I haven't changed the speed at all. And, but I actually 
should have improved my my uh, stability uh, a little bit. Now let's uh, simulate it and see what we have. Now you can see that I haven't really changed things very much at all because I haven't changed my speed gain at all. But if you look at my time response on the current, I'm getting it up to the limit faster, so I've, I'm getting it up in, uh, you know, less than half of the time than I was before. So that's something. I have a better current response, but because my speed response is not changed, I've not really changed anything. So I can't really do get rid of these oscillatory behavior unless I retune the speed loop. If I go back and look at the open loop gain, you know, in this range, let's say right around here, well, right around the crossover, I'm about 130 degrees. Phase margin is a little bit more than 30 degrees. But if you account for the fact that I've neglected the delays of the uh, power electronics, it might actually be pushing me into this range here. And so I need to put, you notice that this is going to get more stable if I push things out. So I'm just going to crank the gains up together and I should get a better response. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my speed proportional gain to 5 and my integral gain to 50 and I'll look at the Bode response. Here's my crossover. I've Im actually improved the response and I've, I've made it more stable. So I should get a better result. So let's simulate. Okay, here I'm simulating. Now look, look at this. All I did was change the speed response, but look at how much I've improved the armature current response here by tuning both of them together. I'm down to about uh, 0.016, 16 milliseconds response on the current. I could probably improve this more if I wanted. Let's see if we can make this thing stable. Uh, actually turned off my speed uh, command. There should be an improvement in the response to the speed, but look, look at this. So I've got a little bit of a ring here. I could probably improve that a little better, but this often you're going to have a trade-off between speed of response and criticality of response or the dampening of the response. So you've got this kind of abrupt change that you need to make. That presents a disturbance to the controller that it needs to address when it hits the command point, but it settles out very quickly. So this might even be the best um, compromise in response. I still can't get it to be as fast as I thought it was, but I had neglected so many things when I came up with this kind of desired speed rate. But I'm really settled out within point uh, say 250 milliseconds of the time when I just started this. I'm at the speed I want to be and I'm very stable. So I'm going to say that I'm happy with this response and I'll go with it. So this is pretty much the end of this uh, recorded lecture and hopefully this gives you an idea of how to tune uh, cascaded PI controllers.